All right, everyone, welcome. We're having um, a little bit of a late start to get our panel together. Um, welcome to our second event on Brexit in our series on Brexit for the Center for the Study of Europe. Today, we will focus on, uh, on Scotland, the case of Scotland in terms of the effects of Brexit. And I wanted to introduce myself and the panelists and let everyone know the format today. My name is Kaya Schilde. I'm a professor at the Pardee School of Global Studies, and I'm the acting director of the Center for the Study of Europe. Our guests are Peter Jackson, who is professor of global security at the University of Glasgow. He's published widely in the field of the history of international relations, modern and contemporary France and security studies. He's a fellow of both the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Royal Historical Society. He also co-directs and leads a research network funded by the Royal Society of Edinburgh entitled Visions of Global Order, Peace, Law, and Security After the First World War. Also with us today, our other panelist is Stephen Gethins, who is a professor of practice in international relations at the University of St. Andrews. He is a Scottish National Party politician, was a member of parliament for Northeast Fife from 2015 to 2019. And in July 2020, he was announced as the chair of EU and Me, which is a campaign for a close relationship between Scotland and the EU after Brexit. He is also the author of Nation to Nation, Scotland's Place in the World. Stephen, how did you want to start? Did you want to go first in the reverse order? Well, let's just, shall we do this in the reverse order while we're waiting just for Peter for a moment? This is um, just like any of these things. We're having a couple of technical difficulties at the moment, but we're going to go with Peter first for some background, then me. But I, I think we can do them both ways round if, if, if everybody's okay to be patient with me and, and, and I'll try and provide some of the um, background on on the way along. Does that does that sound like a plan? Yes, that's fine with me. I think that'll work out even if it wasn't what we planned. So okay, well look, thank you. Can I say first of all, um, thank you for, for hosting um Peter and I today. Um, Scotland's relationship with the European Union is perhaps the driving force um in Scottish politics and in Scottish society at the moment. And this is a really timely um timely opportunity to be able to discuss this with, with our friends in Boston and, and beyond. What, what, what I'm going to do, Kaya, as you, as you rightly pointed out, I'm a, I'm a, I, so for full disclosure, I am political, I'm a member of the Scottish National Party, therefore I am pro-independence. But what I'm going to try and do is give you a little bit of background about why we are where we are. And I think it's helpful for me to spell out where I am with my politics because everybody, all of us have a bias, all of us have, a, have different perspectives, but I'll, I'll do my best um, to try and give you one that, um, that, 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 that is clear and, 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 and hopefully is as, as neutral as possible. But of course, it's up to you to, to make up your minds as to whether or not I've been successful in that endeavor. So let me just give you a little bit of a background um, so it's Brexit and the past, present and future of the Union is the title of today's talk. Peter was going, is, is going to provide a little bit more background about Scotland's past, but let me start here. And it's about the place of Scotland. And I often find this quite useful when I'm talking to international audiences, that one of the things to remember is that the UK is a multinational state. It is not one nation that is made up of... Um, of different parts it's a multinational state and the clues in the name the united kingdom you have the kingdom of scotland the kingdom of england and of course the principality of of wales and then you have northern ireland as well and that means um that when the queen is the, the head of state she is crowned in um in westminster but she's also crowned in saint giles which sits in edinburgh the capital of scotland as well and where i think that differentiation is quite important is it allows you to see how scots perceive themselves and how they see themselves as part of this of this union because even if you're pro-union you're 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 in favor of the uk remaining together most scots think of themselves as their nationality being scottish so I think that's 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 something that's quite helpful. And obviously, the United Kingdom, the clue being in the name, goes back to the Treaty of Union between Scotland and England. But I'll let Peter touch upon that a little bit more um, later. 
Let me talk a little bit about the SNP. The SNP was formed in the 1920s, 1930s, um, didn't have a huge amount of electoral success. Initially, its first MP was elected in 1945, and the SNP has had continual Westminster um, representation since 1967. Um, the, the nature of the SNP is and always has been as a party that is, it sees itself as reasonably progressive, left of centre. Um, it is a pro-immigration um, party, sees the benefits of immigration, it's pro-EU. It, it, it would be seen as a progressive left of centre party. And in the European Parliament, when, when the UK was still in the European Union, the SNP sat with the, with the Green Party in there as a, um, and actually right now, and I'll come on to this in a moment, the Scottish government in Edinburgh is in, um, is in a coalition with the Green Party. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the establishment of the Scottish Parliament onwards. Um, the UK is a multinational state, but in many ways is very centralised with a lot of powers remaining at Westminster and in the Westminster Parliament. But in 1999, the Scottish Parliament was established as a devolved administration um, to provide some self-government back to Scotland and has sat ever since. In the first two terms, you had Labour, Liberal Democrat administrations. And then in 2007, things changed when the SNP won a minority um, it became a minority administration, winning a plurality of seats and a plurality of votes, um, becoming the biggest party with 47 seats out of 129. In 2011, the SNP gained a majority of seats in the Scottish Parliament. Why that's unusual is that the Scottish Parliament is not a first-past-the-post system. The Scottish Parliament is a, a mixed member system, so you have the first-past-the-post constituencies, but they're balanced by the regional list system. That means the Parliament should be more proportionate um, than, of course, Westminster is. And in Westminster, David Cameron's government gained um, a majority of seats on just 36.9% of the vote. That would be impossible in the Scottish Parliament. And that proportionate system is really important because in 2011, when the SNP gained a majority, um, that, that was a set of circumstances that the founders of the Scottish Parliament could not have foreseen. In 2000 and, sorry, in 2014, there was the independence referendum, which many consider to be, me included, would be the first independence referendum took place in 2014. And that happened because in 2011, when the SNP won the election with the majority, Prime Minister David Cameron and First Minister Alex Hammond, sat down and arranged the Edinburgh Agreement, which recognised the right of the Scottish Parliament to have an independent referendum, but of course with a sunset clause, as that one-off transfer of power from Westminster to Holyrood. That independence referendum, like the Brexit referendum, changed Scottish politics forever. That, that seems to be our experience over the past few years, is that referendums fundamentally change politics. And what happened in 2014? Well, for a while, and I know Peter's going to touch upon this um, in a moment, the um, yes side and a yes to independence trailed in the polls. I know that from first-hand experience because as an advocate for independence, I'd be the guy that would have to go on television and say that when we're at 28, 29% in the polls, how, how that was exactly where we wanted to be. And you'll know that from seeing talking heads. So I remember how difficult it was for a while. And then in 2014, it changed. And what you saw was the yes side went from about 28, 29 into the 30s percent up to on polling day, 45 percent of the vote on a turnout of about 86 percent, which is an exceptionally high turnout. I think it's the highest turnout we've ever seen in Scotland. In fact, it might be the highest turnout we've seen um, in, a, in a democratic vote anywhere in the United Kingdom. People engaged with the issue. They took their vote really seriously. If there were yes voters or no voters, they took their vote seriously. And for people who are involved in politics, the biggest thing you can ever ask for is that people take their vote seriously and take decision making seriously. And that happened in Scotland. And what did that mean? So although the yes campaign, the pro-independence campaign fell short in 2014, what happened was that changed politics. At the subsequent 2015, general election to Westminster, so a first-past-the-post system similar to your own system at federal level in the United States, 
the SNP won 56 out of 59 seats in Westminster. 56 out of 59. Now, the Conservatives came back with a majority because there are 650 seats in the UK as a whole. But what you saw was that fundamental change in both voting patterns um, and in the success of the SNP, which up until then, its highest number of seats had been 11 back in the 1970s. Things changed further in 2016 when we had the EU referendum. Now, this SM, there'd been a Scottish Parliament election in 2016, just six weeks before the EU referendum, just six weeks. And that was something that I, as a member of Parliament at the time, argued that we should, we should take longer. And just six weeks after the referendum, you had the EU referendum. Now, this is a really important fact. In the 2016 election, the SNP went into that Scottish parliamentary election with a manifesto commitment saying that there should be um, another independent referendum if there was a fundamental change in circumstances, and it explicitly said, such as Scotland being taken out of the EU against its will. The SNP won that election with that manifesto commitment prior to the EU referendum. What happens a few weeks later um, is you have the EU referendum in the UK. The UK as a whole votes narrowly to leave the European Union. Scotland votes, um, I think, pretty overwhelmingly, 62% um, to 38% to remain in the European Union. And that results in Scotland being taken out of the EU against its will. But there's also a further backdrop to this for those of you who are following it. Um, and I lived this as a parliamentarian in the parliament. What followed was that it wasn't simply a case that people voted to leave the EU and then we had a simple process. Because the Leave campaign had never stipulated what kind of model of leaving the EU should mean, should we stay in the single market and the customs union but leave? Should there be divergence in some areas but not in others? This was never set out. So for four years, four and a half very painful years, the Westminster Parliament tried to reach some kind of agreement um, as to what Brexit meant. This resulted in absolute chaos that you probably followed on your TV screens, that you followed in the press in the United States when governance in the UK came to a, almost a virtual standstill, that you had this deadlock and frankly a constitution in the UK that wasn't seen to be fit for purpose because there hadn't been any constitutional um, changes for so long and it's quite an old and out of date system as well. This changed things in Scotland too. And it changed things in Scotland because not only were Scots being taken out of the EU against their will, but what was more is that they were seeing um, what was happening at Westminster as, um, as, 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 as if you like the government had more areas of responsibility than Scotland itself did. Um, this changed views of the union and what we saw was in the aftermath of 2016, we saw slowly but surely a shift from there being um, a, a majority, consistent majority in opinion polls for, for um, no to remain in the UK to one where there was a consistent majority for yes around about 2018, 2019, and it settled round about 50-50 nowadays. What was driving this? Well, what drove it was that a roughly one in five no voters or those who had backed no now shifted to yes. They were driven by Brexit. And if we look at the different tribes, you get the people who are um, no voters against independence and against um, and sorry, no voters who are against the EU, making up one chunk, no voters in favour of the EU, making up another chunk, but far and away the biggest chunk of voters were yes to independence and yes to remain in the EU. So the cleavage in Scottish constitutional politics has very much come down to one of um, a similar cleavage elsewhere in the UK politics between leave and, and remain. And in many ways, people in Scotland are being given two options. One is the union of the UK, and one is the union in the European Union. So it's a choice of two unions. And critically, that was not a choice that they had to make in 2014, because you could argue, well, I want to remain in the, the United Kingdom, and I also want to remain in the EU. That was an option. Um, others would have said, well, we want Scotland to be independent as a full member state of the European Union. Interestingly, during that referendum, nobody was nobody, or not in any great numbers, were advocating for Scotland to leave the EU at all. It was either 
are we better in the European Union as part of the UK or are we better in the European Union as a member state in our own right? And that's really interesting dynamic. Um, so I'm, and, and so I'm just going to pass on to Peter in just, in just one moment, but let me just pick up on a couple of issues. Um, what now? Well, we're at an impasse. And the reason we're at an impasse is that in 2021, we saw the SNP being re-elected um, in the latest elections with 64 out of 129 seats in a proportional system. You might say, well, they didn't reach a majority, but they did, um, but pro-independence parties did. The Green Party got their best ever result. So the SNP got its best ever result in terms of constituencies, first past the post seats. The Green Party got their best ever result. The Labour Party got their worst ever result. The Liberal Democrats got their worst ever result. And the Conservatives did not progress. They still got a reasonably good result, but they were really far behind the SNP. So you have another yes majority or majority for another independence referendum in the Scottish Parliament. But you have a UK government that has vowed to block that referendum and the UK Parliament still has responsibilities for referendums. So what comes next, and maybe we can explore this a little bit further um, after Peter's come in, what comes next? Well, frankly, I don't know. Um, but if you look at the numbers <laughs> in Scotland, we're about 50% for independence, 50% against independence. People are voting for political parties based along those lines. And what's the big difference between a yes voter and a no voter? Well, we're finding increasingly it's not geography. The SNP and independence parties are successful across Scotland. It's not educational attainment. Um, it's not income. The biggest difference between a yes voter and a no voter is one of age. And actually what, what you find is very high levels of support for independence up until people hit about the age of 60 and then it falls off a cliff. And I would encourage you, um, I'm at St Andrews, Peter's at um, Glasgow University, but I'd encourage you to look at the great work being done at Edinburgh University by Elsa Henderson, who looks into these demographics and whether they're demographics um, in terms of will that change over age, I don't think so, or cohorts. So is independence inevitable? I don't know, but I'll tell you what is inevitable, and that's another couple of years of there being political impasse between Holyrood and Westminster and that continuing to dominate Scottish politics. And with that, we've kind of done it the wrong way around, but I know Peter's got some really interesting slides and some fantastic um, background that hopefully makes what I've said make a little bit more, more sense, as Peter often does. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Yeah, I'm very sorry for what happened. Normally, it's my technical incompetence that causes these disasters. But in this case, it was something to do with firewalls that I don't really understand. We've managed to, to breach through them. And I'm here, and I'm really glad to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Thanks uh, to all of you for, for coming along. And thanks to Stephen for stepping in and manning the helm while while I was uh, trying to get in. I am, uh, I should probably provide a bit of a disclaimer. I'm uh, not Scottish and I'm not an historian of Scotland. I am a historian of international relations generally, but also I suppose with a specific interest in uh, mainland Europe. But having lived in Scotland for the past eight or nine years now, I uh, have followed with fascination the the trajectory of Scottish politics, the trajectory of politics within the United Kingdom. And what I wanted to do, and this is obviously a bit of a backwards way of doing things, is provide you with a bit of historical background to what's going on now, because I do think that the history of relations between Scotland and England uh, provides quite a lot of context to some of the core issues that we're facing. At the moment, so with your indulgence, I will share my screen with a slide like that. Yeah, that's perfect, yeah. Good, good. Okay, because probably one of my central arguments that I want to make today, one of the key points I want to get across from you is that uh, the future of the United Kingdom is very much at stake. And it's a result of changing dynamics within the union as a whole. I have a really close friend who's an uber unionist. He's a former, he's a brigadier general in the, the British army. And he said to me a while back, you know, Peter, I don't feel as if 
I'm leaving the union in any sense, but I do feel as if the union is leaving me. And I'm going to try and provide a bit of background context to this. And I suppose it's important to go right back to the beginning and remind ourselves that Scotland up until 1707 or 1603, if you like, was an independent kingdom uh, with its own history, its own uh, politics, its own so social uh, structures, its own legal system, and its own national and international interests, I guess. And that changes with the uh, advent of the Act of Union in 1707. The prelude to this is very interesting. And this is something that may not interest many of you, but it's something I didn't know about, but it's in many ways a very important prelude to the Act of Union. And that is uh, something that's often called the Darien Scheme. And it was an idea uh, within the Scottish elite to in fact launch Scotland as an imperial power through a project to colonize the Isthmus of Panama and in fact build a land route and possibly even eventually a, uh, a canal of some kind linking the Pacific and the Atlantic oceans and making Scotland an imperial power and a competitor on the world stage in the imperial, an imperial enterprise that was making its English neighbor very rich. And this is enormously popular. A uh, company of Scotland was set up uh, to, with the idea of creating a new Caledonia. And I think what's really important is 20% of all money circulating in Scotland at the time was invested in this scheme. And it was a scheme that was opposed by the English parliament. It was opposed by the British crown or the, 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 the crown. And uh, it ended up being a financial disaster because it was sabotaged by well, I suppose sabotage is a strong word. It was certainly opposed and uh, uh, English colonies, when, when, when the, this new Caledonia project ran into trouble, the English colonies refused their help and it created a financial disaster, which is one of the important backdrops for the Act of Union in 1707. One of the main, uh, I suppose, motivations for Scotland going in to the Act of Union was its acute financial weakness, which was amplified by this Darien scheme that I mentioned to you before, but also because I think Scottish enterprises wanted access to the markets of England and above all its empire. And so to understand the Union of 1707, it's really important to uh, be aware that it were economic incentives and in particular, the idea of Scotland benefiting from the growth of the English empire that was a major incentive for entering into union. Uh, there was, of course, before this, a union of crowns back in 1603, when King James I succeeded Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, and declared himself King of Great Britain. Uh, for England, I think the, the motivations were a centralizing impulse of the modern English state, which were, I think, focused by short-term security concerns about the future of the Scottish crown, the, the danger that uh, uh, someone from the con European continent might claim the Scottish crown and threaten uh, the security of England. And so therefore it was in many ways short-term political and security concerns, along with the kind of centralizing uh, dynamics of modern states that, that ended up inducing the English to go into a union. The result was really the end of the Scottish Parliament in, on the 1st of May, I think it was, 1707. Uh, however, the Church of Scotland and remained independent and Scots law remained in force. And this is something that persists to this day. Many historians and many political commentators have argued that the Act of Union was a modernizing moment for Scotland, granting Scottish uh, businessmen access to the enormous opportunities presented by the, uh, the, 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 the British Empire. And it was empire that was a big, uh, a big, uh, uh, was the crucial, I think, 
consequence uh, of this of, 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 or the attraction, but also the consequence of the Act of Union because uh, the Scottish became in many ways, uh, in, in some cases, the conquerors of imperial possessions, but above all, the administrators of empire and providing uh, labor, providing uh, expertise and things like engineering. And this was part, I think, of the emergence, the slow emergence of a British identity, which I guess coalesces, if one believes Linda Colley, around about the time of the Napoleonic Wars, in a sense, a real joint enterprise between England, Scotland, and, and Wales in not only uh, conquering empires, but also in defeating uh, Napoleonic France. This, I think, is a, in many ways uh, deepened and, and the sense of a British identity deepened and amplified or accelerated by the experience of the Industrial Revolution, which is very important in bringing about a profound transformation of Scottish society. By the mid uh, middle of the eight, 19th century, Scotland was a world leader in heavy industry and especially shipbuilding, was often called the workshop of the British Empire, the second city of the British Empire. And this in many ways, if you like, lock Scotland in, in terms of industry, into the British Empire in a sense of joint enterprise in, in with, with, with the rest of the United Kingdom in ways that were, I think, very, very important, uh, not least uh, uh, during the experiences of the two world wars. And in particular, I think the Second World War, for any of you who've spent is a kind of pass a day in the United Kingdom without hearing some reference to the Second World War and Britain's role on a whole series of really pervasive, but in some ways pernicious myths have grown up around the Second World War and Britain's role in it as being the kind of, I suppose, the country that did the most to defeat the Nazis, which of course is, is in many ways nonsensical. It was the, the, uh, the Red Army and American industrial power which defeated Nazi Germany, not the United Kingdom. However, these myths are very important to this day. They have underwritten the kind of nostalgia infused ideologies which have underpinned the movement for leaving the EU, for example, the sense that the United Kingdom was not part of what in many ways the EU was initially considered to be, was a club of defeated nations. And the, I suppose, more nationalistic, patriotic uh, end of the spectrum in terms of British public opinion, public sentiment, always felt a little uncomfortable and always felt that membership of the European Union was basically an economic contract rather than a project to build a better society and preserve peace and prevent the return of another destructive war, which were some of these, some of the key elements underpinning the European project. I don't think that a large swathe of British opinion ever bought into that. And this is some of the reasons why, because of Britain's role of, uh, as standing up to Nazi Germany, because Britain was a world power and world power shouldn't belong to regional, uh, uh, some kind of regional unions of, of any kind. And so there's unease in a way is rooted in this period, which David Edgerton calls the kind of, I suppose, the high, martyr, mar high watermark of British nationhood between, I suppose, 1945 and the mid to late 1980s. And it, this is all very interesting because the generation that Stephen has referred to, the older, the 60s and above, and I'm a little too close to that generation for comfort at the moment, but there is a sense amongst, I think, that generation that, you know, Scotland belongs in the Union because the Union has achieved all of these wonderful things. And, uh, this is the generation that grew up in that post-45 environment, characterized in particular by a social and political settlement of which Scotland was, I think, a very, uh, a very willing participant in the rise of the welfare state, the rise of the, the establishment of the National Health Service, and all of the things, I suppose, that uh, uh, many in Great Britain at the moment see as being under threat for one reason 
or another. But the 1980s, really the late 1970s uh, through the 1980s were a, were a time of profound economic and social and cultural change in the United Kingdom, not least because Britain ha had reached by the 1970s, the tail end of its retreat from empire. And this, I would argue, has had a very important impact on self-perceptions, if you like, self-identifications within the UK, because uh, for a generation that grew up, you know, with the pictures of the British Empire at the front of their schoolrooms, as in fact I did in Canada, interestingly, uh, the idea that the British Empire no longer counted is very difficult to accept. Uh, this is maybe part of the reason why, you know, Britain spending money on aircraft carriers that have no real strategic purpose other than sailing around the Pacific to try and I suppose, remind people that Britain still counts, uh, perhaps also to support uh, the relationship with the United States, which is another way in which Great Britain, I think, reaffirms to itself in this relationship that it still counts in world affairs, because Britain is really unable to project power seriously in geopolitical terms without the United States. But this is a fiction, the fiction that Britain is an independent world power is still very, very important and very popular, as I imagine you heard last week, as I think you did hear from Eric Goldstein. In Scotland, however, things were different because Scotland was entering a post-industrial phase. One of the key moments in this was the collapse of the Upper Clyde Shipbuilding Consortium in 1972, the decline, decline of the Scottish steel, coal, and manufacturing industries. This, this is a picture of a former uh, site of British steel in near, near Lanarkshire in Motherwell, which was an enormous, enormous kind of steel plant just 35, maybe 40 years ago now. And what this led to in this kind of post-industrial moment is a fragmenting of labor heartlands because this was, I suppose, one of the most impregnable seats of power for the Labour Party right from the Second World War through to uh, I suppose the first decade of the 20th century. This begins to come apart uh, and it, you know, and it, it coalesces in some ways in a rejection of Thatcherism and a revival of something that I would, I, I understand myself as Scottish politics and the rise of Scottish nationalism, which in many ways is a, as much a rejection of changes I that were launched, were perceived as being launched by England into Scottish society. Uh, not least uh, the rise of the Conservative Party to power in 1979 and the threat that the Thatcherite revolution, which is a real attempt to move Britain away from uh, that the age of heavy industry and big government towards a new and much more entrepreneurial future. This was something that was profoundly uh, most Scots were profoundly uncomfortable with, I think. Thatcher's securities, Thatcher's conservatives, excuse me, secured decisive majorities in England, but they were rejected time and again, just as decisively in Scotland. And there was a growing sense that Scotland, that there was a democratic deficit and that Scotland was uh, getting government that it didn't vote for time and time again. And in some ways really coalesced uh, over the issue of the poll tax, which was a, a, not a graduated tax, it was a tax imposed on uh, all citizens of a certain age. And it was a Tory project, it was a conservative project imposed first in Scotland, interestingly. A year before it came into force in England, it was, it was uh, put forth in, in Scotland, deeply, deeply unpopular, right across the spectrum of Scottish opinion, uh, with the exception, I suppose, of, of the Tory supporting right. Uh, and it became a classic example of a, an unwanted policy imposed on Scotland by a government for which it did not vote. At the same time, Thatcher refused to consider, to, to, to even consider addressing the perceived uh, democratic deficit with some movements towards greater devolution the centralizing tendencies of the Thatcher era were perceived in Scotland, as I mentioned here, as in many ways, an illegitimate 
interference uh, from England into the to, to Scotland. And in some ways it ignored some of the unwritten dimensions of the act of union that Scottish society would be granted considerable autonomy in managing its own affairs. And this led to the demise of the Labour Party in Scotland uh, in 1997, that should read, I'm sorry. After 18 years of Tory rule in Westminster, there were no Conservative MPs left in Scotland at all. And so this raised the, the, the prospect of devolution in Scotland, which I said that goes back to this idea of a democratic deficit. In 1979, interestingly, the year Thatcher came to power in Westminster and the Conservatives, uh, the Scottish electorate gave very lukewarm support to the idea of creating a separate elective assembly and I suppose opening the way to devolution. The turnout was something like 32, 33% in a referendum, or at least the, the, the turnout was insufficient to uh, reach a threshold of 40% of the eligible Scottish electorate, which was the, the, the threshold set for uh, the creation of some kind of separate Scottish assembly. By 1997, as I mentioned, after 18 years of Tory rule, the Scots voted three to one in favor of establishing a, a national parliament. Uh, a new devolution settlement was acknowledged, it was, was negotiated, uh, and these areas where Scottish society was to have autonomy were actually laid out in a constitutional settlement. The two key ones, I suppose, are education and health, uh, the most significant. These are areas that are now the responsibility of Scottish government, Scottish legislation, and the Scottish government now has the right to, modest right, to, to raise some, some tax in order to, uh, uh, to pay for, for these, uh, these services. And a Scottish parliament was recreated an investment in 1999. The idea of the new Labour government under Tony Blair, I'm sorry for my appalling spelling here, was, uh, and this I think of direct quotation, to lance the boil of nationalist settlement uh, and support for independence in Scotland. And it had the opposite effect. In fact, it provided nationalist politics in Scotland with a platform they didn't, they, they, they didn't have access to before, uh, and also a route to political power within Scotland for the SNP. And in fact, only eight years after the Scottish Parliament was invested, the Scottish National Party under Alex Salmon won its first election in 2007, achieved a majority in 2011, which is remarkable. It's a system that's in fact designed to prevent majorities. And uh, in 2011, the Scottish Parliament with a manifesto to uh, hold a manifesto pledge to hold a referendum uh, actually achieved power, achieved a majority in the Scottish Parliament in a system of proportional representation designed to prevent majorities. This made it very difficult for the Tory government to continue to resist the idea of uh, a, a referendum. And when the Conservative government, led by David Cameron, agreed to an independence referendum, support for yes or independence in Scotland was polling at between a quarter, roughly between a quarter and a third. And there was a sense that there was little chance uh, that Scotland would vote to leave the European, to leave the United Kingdom. The yes strategy was, in fact, I was, I was in Scotland for this. I didn't know Stephen at the time, but uh, uh, I was found it very interesting that the yes strategy was very popular, very, very positive rather. It was based on the argument that Scotland wasn't necessarily better than any other nation, but it was a nation, a legitimate nation in itself that was as good as any other and just as capable of managing its own affairs. While, while the, uh, the, the government strategy, the Westminster strategy of no was almost entirely and unremittingly negative. It was the idea that uh, a vote for independence would introduce a period of economic Armageddon in Scotland. And at the center of this was the idea that the Scots, uh, the Scottish, uh, the SNP and the aspiring uh, self-governing party of Scotland couldn't say what currency it intended to use. And the currency became a hugely important issue in the referendum. 
In the end, uh, yes, polled 45%, no achieved a majority of 55%. And in way, some ways, this is not that close. It's certainly a lot less close than the EU referendum of 2016. However, in some ways, it's unthinkable that eight years or sorry, uh, 14 years after the establishment of a Scottish parliament and the introduction of devolution as a way to, uh, I suppose, disarm Scottish uh, national sentiment. In fact, yes, was, was doing pretty well. I think there was a lot of shock at this, but also I think a lot of relief in London. And it led to a really important moment. The morning after the referendum was announced, I'm sorry if Stephen, have you discussed this at all? Uh, a bit because I don't want. I've to just touched upon it, but I think I think what you're saying complements what, what what I was saying, or I hope so anyway. But you're, you're you're putting it much better, Peter. I don't think that's. I can't imagine that's the case. But in any case, the morning after the referendum, uh, David Cameron uh, got on the podium before Number Ten in Downing Street. You see him there, and rather than uh, I suppose I expected him to give some kind of. Uh, a speech uh, aimed at, I suppose, assuaging the, uh, the hurt of the Yes movement and some kind of unifying theme to be, to, to be at the center of what he said, but it, it was quite the opposite, in fact. He said, in a, and this is a direct quote, the voice of England must also be heard. This is the morning after the referendum. And uh, what he was responding to was the fact that uh, he was being outflanked on the right by the rise of English nationalism. In some ways, this is uh, uh, encapsulated by what's often called the West Lothian question. The idea that Scots MPs can vote on issues that affect England specifically, but English MPs have uh, no voice in Holyrood. And that in fact, England is underrepresented, and there's a democratic deficit uh, to, the, to the detriment of, of England and English politics and English identity. And what we noticed at the time, I think, was an acknowledgement of the importance of the rise of English nationalism. And this is really important because, of course, English nationalism mark, maps in some ways almost directly onto uh, something that happened two years later, which is the referendum to leave the EU. And this is a, David Cameron, I think, reckoning with this problem in on the 20, on, on the 14th of September, 2014, the, the morning after the referendum. But there were also other important changes in Scotland because during the referendum campaign for Scottish independence, the Tories and the Labour, the Tory and the Labour parties campaign side by side on what was called a better together platform. And so, and they had also underpinned this idea of a vow where, uh, you know, Scotland will be given greater devolution. This was negotiated by former Labour Prime Minister Tom, uh, Gordon Brown. And rather than follow through on the vow, of course, what, what Scotland heard was that the voice of England now had to be heard. And one of the results of this was in some ways uh, the destruction of the Labour Party in Scotland. In the 2015 UK general elections, the SNP won 56 of 59 seats. One of them was my friend and Collins, colleague Stephen. Uh, and uh, Labour lost 40 seats. They went down to one seat in Scotland. Scotland had been basically the greatest, the most secure Labour stronghold, the greatest kind of one of the greatest Scottish exports was Labour MPs to Westminster. And this has changed. This has changed dramatically. And uh, this, I think, in many ways sets up the, uh, the move towards the EU referendum in 2016, which Stevens talked about. And the only thing I would add to that is that, and from my perspective as someone who voted no in 2014 to Scottish independence, one of the reasons I voted no was to my, in my sense, really a vote against nationalism, which has always made me uncomfortable as an historian of uh, the 20th century Europe. I, I have a, a kind of a, a real familiarity with the damage that nationalism 
can do uh, in both national and international politics. And so I understood my vote as a vote against nationalism. When I voted in 2016, I'm happy and proud to say I voted to stay in the EU. It was once again an anti-nationalist vote. Uh, however, in this case, uh, you know, I think that the EU referendum vote was a victory for English nationalism. And if you look at some of the leading figures in the, uh, re the, the movement to leave the EU uh, during the referendum, they're now politici leading politicians practicing, I suppose, the politics of nationalism writ large over the United Kingdom. Another reason I voted no in 2016 was to stay in the European Union because it was presented explicitly uh, as an argument that you know to vote no to remain in the UK was a guarantee of staying in the EU because there would be no guarantee that an independent Scotland would be allowed to rejoin the EU, especially if the rest of the UK was still a member and could veto its membership. And of course, none of that's worked out and we are, we are. I'm hoping now we can hear questions from all of you because uh, 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 I suppose some of the most interesting exchanges we can have really are going to be in question and answer. And once again, I'm sorry for holding proceedings up earlier. Peter, shall I let you go first with some of the historical questions. These are really good questions. There's a couple of things I'd like to come in on as well. What do you think? Well, I, th I think one thing I would say is that, and uh, this speaks to, to I suppose, the, 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 the fabric of popular sentiment in Scotland is, it's my sense, it's my very clear sense, and maybe this is an experience of being in the union, but also having a sense of being a nation, that, that Scots are much more at ease with multiple layers of identity. They can be Scottish, they can be British, they can be European. There's not the same sense of discomfort, I don't think, that there is that one sees in large swathes of opinion in England. This is again from uh, Elsa, Lisa Henderson, the, the, a Canadian Scot uh, that Stephen referred to earlier, working at Edinburgh. And she's found this, that there is a sense of, you know, kind of overlaid identities aren't as much of an issue in Scotland, political and, and, ethnic, and, and national identities, as, as they are in other parts of the UK, in particular in England. Um, just on those questions, I, so I want, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle the one about divergences in terms of policies between Scotland and England, and I'll, I'll say this, one of the things that any frontline politician has, has to do is that you spend a lot of time speaking to people your constituents or your boss, um, and you spend a lot of time thinking about politics. Now, one thing that struck me when I became an MP back in 2015, and I went to Westminster, was the political debate at Westminster was very different from the political debate at Holyrood. So I'll, I'll touch upon, even before the EU referendum, we had a refugee crisis. And in Scotland, you know, the taking in of refugees, um, having immigration from elsewhere in the EU is, is seen as a positive thing. There's no party that really campaigns against it. And you see a refugees welcome campaigners outside airports when, when, when they're coming in. So I struggled with some of the um, politics um, and the um, I, I, I struggled with some aspects of that south of the border, which were very different. Also in areas like climate change, cutting international development, and then the debate about the EU. You saw a divergence between the centre of gravity in terms of Scottish politics and the centre of gravity in English politics as well. And that was reflected in the EU referendum. Incidentally, it's also reflected in how people vote. So consistently, um, people have voted for the SNP in, 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 in the past three UK general elections. Um, prior to that, they're voting for the Labour Party. They haven't, I don't think the Conservatives have won an election in Scotland since 1955. That's a long time, given that the Conservatives have been um, in power in, at a UK level for the majority of that time. So I think there is a divergence in terms of the, 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 the politics and how people see themselves in, in the world. 
And on this issue, I'm going to talk about identity in a moment and the multiple layers of identity that I think Peter has quite rightly highlighted. But on this final question here about the Green Party nationalist stroke separatist alliances, it's described here as a marriage of convenience. Well, in a proportional system, any coalition is a marriage of convenience. You know, you get different political parties, but try and find as much common ground as they can. There's a huge amount of common ground between the Green Party and the SNP, and that's why they were in the same group in the European Parliament, that they, they have a lot of common ground. So every coalition is a marriage of convenience. And remember, the, Cro the Green Party is a pro-independence party as well. It's there to be pro-independence. So there are other pro-independence parties. You know, you get the Socialists, you get the newly formed Alapa Party, but the SNP and the Green Party are both far and away the largest pro-independence parties. Both are left of centre, both are progressive, both, both are pro-action on climate change, both are pro-returning to the European Union. So there's a lot of commonality um, there. I also, Peter talked about English nationalism and you can talk about Scottish nationalism or separatism. I mean, these are quite the term separatist. It's quite a pejorative term, given that the SNP and the pro-independence, people are pro-independence, want to rejoin the EU. So if you like, become less isolationist, pro-independence campaigners would argue than remaining in the UK, which would be, in my opinion, and the opinion of those who are pro-independence, and there are other views available, of course, would be less isolationist. And that comes down to this multiple layers of identity that Peter identified, and this is quite important. I always think that um, in international relations, one of the great things about it is you can learn lessons um, about different parts of the world and how unique each part of the world is. But there's an awful lot of overlapping, um, of, of overlapping narratives. Now, in Scotland, our next door neighbours, there's no right way to look at a globe. And if you look at our next door neighbours in the Nordic states, there you've got a series of states whereby you've got Finland sits inside the EU and the Euro. You have Sweden and Denmark inside the EU, outside the Euro. Norway outside the EU, but very close to the European Union. The same with Iceland as well. And then you have sub-state actors um, like the Holland Islands sits inside the EU, joined with Finland, but didn't have to. And you have the Faroese and the Greenlandic who are part of Denmark, but sit outside the European Union. So they have their Nordic identity, they have their national identity, and they have their regional identity. And they're deeply comfortable with that as well. And I'm wondering if that's going to be the kind of model that will settle in the British Isles in the future. Let's say, you know, you've got Ireland in the EU and in the Euro. Could Scotland become an independent member state of the European Union, but sit outside the Euro like Sweden and Denmark? And it may be that certain sub-state actors like the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands, which have always had an unusual relationship in their own unique relationship with the European Union, could continue to have that unique relationship as well. So I always think you don't need to go that far till you see a set of circumstances which may be applicable in the British Isles over the next decade. Great. There has been a question about referenda in the chat, which is very interesting because they are very imperfect means of exercising uh, democracy, representative democracy. Uh, it's particularly over questions like leaving the EU or Scottish independence, where you know the consequences are absolutely transformational. And if one leaves a large segment of people who didn't get their way and are unhappy with, with the outcome, this can raise all kinds of social and political issues, uh, who knows where, where they'll lead. So they're very imperfect means of exercising democracy. On the other hand, people, for example, in favor of either rejoining joining the EU and with an, under independent Scotland, there's no other route. There's no other route to, to something like that, unless there's some kind of constitutional renegotiation of the British state that allows for different regions to have different memberships and other uh, regional conglomerations. I don't see, I don't see the, uh, the way forward other than a referendum, but it will be tricky. I know I have friends in Police Scotland and they have told me that uh, the consequences of a yes vote in Scottish independence would be, would pose all kinds of problems for them because 
they might even fear political violence on the part of, of uh, I suppose maybe that I shouldn't have said that out, out loud. I hope we can take that as this as being Chatham House rules and you won't quote me on this, but I mean, their, their referenda are, are deeply problematic, but then, you know, one returns to Winston Churchill's uh, summation of democracy as the worst possible way, means of organizing society politically, except for everything else that's being tried. So there are no perfect solutions in, in politics. And, and, and maybe if I can just make an observation on that, and I'm sorry, because we've got so many good questions there, and there, there's so much in those that, that, that we could be here for a while. Um, but just briefly on the question of referendum, I think for the, the issue of political violence, we must always be mindful of this. I think you'd be irresponsible to live in any democratic society and take civilised debate, discussion and democracy granted. I don't think anybody can ever take it for granted. That being said, I think in Scotland, we should take some pride that we have debated and discussed an issue like independence that elsewhere has caused um, violence, and we've and we and we've done so in a civic um, manner. Um, and that's not to say that there are no passions. Passions are very, very high. People feel very strongly about that. But it's something that I personally feel great pride in that that that, that, that we have had this very difficult discussion, but in a in a civic manner. And long may that continue. Um, on the question of, I think Peter's right. Um, of course, referendums have their have their issues, and 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 his quote from Winston Churchill was a was a good one. So, what can we learn between Brexit and the independence referendum? Well, it's probably this: the problem with Brexit and and the chaos that ensued wasn't leaving the European Union itself. It was because we did not have a plan for leaving the European Union before we voted. Now, in the United Kingdom system, as elsewhere. What do you do if you're in politics? You set out a manifesto, you set out your full proposals before the vote. And what that means is your proposals are interrogated and it's sometimes quite uncomfortable, believe you me, but it means that hopefully the voter makes a more informed choice. And after the decision has been made, um, there you have a, a mandate for whatever you're proposing. Now, there was a 680 page white paper which set out a large number of areas of how an independent Scotland would fit in the world, what the Scottish government would seek to do, you know, joining NATO, joining the European Union, for example, um, continuing with a single electricity market and a wide range of areas. That didn't exist with Brexit. And I think that has to be a learning point. And that, look, there will always be an element of uncertainty in any politics anywhere in the world. But I think that people deserve to know what you are proposing before the vote, and that didn't happen, and that's what happened, and that's why we had the political impasse in, in the aftermath of the EU referendum in June 2016. Sorry for jumping in again there, Peter. That's fine. Yeah, I've got a question, folks, if you, you don't, don't mind me jumping in. Hey, thanks for great presentations. Really enjoyed it. Um, so I'm sitting here in the, the provincial backwaters of England in Birmingham, and I guess my question to you is just a more immediate almost concern uh, which turn of this and that is to what extent do you think that if any a change in government in England <laughs> purportedly in the UK in other words if Boris Johnson was to go now and be replaced by someone from within the Conservative Party of say more of a different attitude a different attitude towards policy as well as rhetoric or indeed if labor did come into power to what extent would that change the dynamic? for the independence movement in Scotland, or I guess to put it in you know, broader academic terms, to what extent do you see the independence movement in Scotland right now turning on more transitory issues in terms of what is the person in power in the UK? And to what extent is it now basically turning upon structural issues, organizational issues, uh, both in London and also in Brussels? Thanks very much. When Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And then, and then you can tell me if you think I've got it right and or if I'm overly biased. Scott, that's a cracking question, and it's one that is posed as a really good question. Um, so first of all, a reality check, which is, but I am going to address the question. Um, politics in England have changed because of the EU referendum. We saw that there was a by-election recently in Hartlepool, and we wonder, and a lot of political scientists think we're maybe seeing the same changes um, to politics in England, as you've seen in Scotland, whereby you've got this big, these big shifts, or you've seen in the United States in recent years. So you have areas that backed Brexit, and, and often the areas, and, and in Hartlepool and elsewhere, where there might have been unemployment, where 
people feel a little bit left behind. Um, and also a Conservative Party that's maybe that little bit more populist in the past. So you're seeing some shifts that we've seen elsewhere in the world there. Um, so I can't see the Conservatives, I can't see Labour winning the next election, but lots of things change in politics. Um, things are very difficult to predict, as we all know. The same and the same British politics, Scottish politics, US politics, European politics, things change. So on the question of if things would change, um, I think Boris Johnson um, provides a boost for the independence cause. I don't think there's any question of that. But I wonder if that ship has sailed in terms of Brexit changes everything. So if people, if, if, if you know that choice between two unions, between the UK, which is not a club for independent member states, and the European Union that is, have things changed? And if you look at consistent polling, even when you have a third option of, say, the status quo, independence, and um, some kind of increased powers for the Scottish Parliament, for example, consistently, the independents, um, those in favour of independence are still out in front in the polling. And I think that because of Brexit, federalism does not solve Brexit. You know, federalism might have been an answer in, in the past for a number of voters. I'm not sure whether that is the case um, anymore. And also, and I'll, I'll make this observation, um, the Labour Party and the Conservatives will often play the SNP as the, the bogeyman, if, 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 if you like, which makes having Scots in positions of power at Westminster difficult when they're, when they're doing that, rather than in other European countries whereby you can have coalition governments. So I think that makes things difficult because you're almost telling the voters, and it's something you should never do in politics, and I think we've seen this in the United States, there's almost the case of people trying to tell the voters, you got it wrong, so please try and get it right and vote for a pro-UK party, as, as, as Labour MPs were arguing just last week. I always think that's a failed strategy politically. Um, and just finally, before I... Um, before I, I, I hand over to, to Peter, I think the electorate have moved on um, as, 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 as well in terms of independence. So, you know, if you, you can criticise the SNP's domestic record, I think it's pretty good, stands up, others disagree, but fundamentally people are making up their mind based on the constitutional question. So I, I, I can see your point, Scott, but I'm not sure it would change much. I, I, I don't have a lot uh, to add or uh, to disagree with in what Stephen said, and I'm conscious that we want to leave time for some more questions. Uh, I would probably say that some kind of a settlement that granted Scotland the ability to have a status like Northern Ireland enjoys at the moment would, I, th I think, possibly be the only the only solution that would really uh, prove attractive to people that that demographic that that Stephen mentioned, who were turned by Brexit, and uh, we see at the moment the Tory Party trying to roll back Northern Ireland status uh, under the good under the uh, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol because it's damaging to the integrity of the UK state. So I just don't. I certainly don't see this government. And I don't think that a Labour government would either. It's hard to say, though, what a future Labour government might look like. I don't see Keir Starmer leading the way. He seems to be not, not, not very, uh, doesn't seem to have many ideas about you know, the way forward for the United Kingdom. He doesn't seem to be able to criticize the, the Tory party, but maybe I'm being unfair to him. There is another interesting question from Neris, uh, one of the people, I know there's another person in the audience from Wales as well, asking us to think about the differences between Welsh nationals and Scottish nationalism. Stephen will probably have more to say about this, at least be better informed than I am. But one thing I will say is a kind of an opening gambit is, my sense is that the unionist parties in Scotland are in different ways, all of them with possible exception of the Lib Dems, but I could be wrong there, are experiencing a crisis of their Scottishness and having difficulty coming to terms with the fact that they are in and of Scotland. And uh, I don't see that 
happening in the same way in Wales. Mark Dreyfer, the outgoing leader of the Labour Party in, in Wales, uh, the party that's in power in, in the Welsh Assembly, the Senate, uh, is very comfortable in opening up to the elements within the labor movement in Wales that are sympathetic to independence in the way the labor movement in Scotland just isn't. And if you think about the, the demise of labor in Scotland since the Scottish referendum, there's still only one labor MP in all of Scotland at the moment. I, I have a sense that perhaps the Labour Party in Wales are playing a smarter game and engaging and trying to bring uh, independence sympathizers within Wales into a broader Labour tent. But I could, be, I could be being a bit idealistic about that. I'm more interested in what Stephen says on this question. Thanks, Peter. And, and now it's a good question. I, I have to say, I, I know less about Wales. I mean, I worked with Plaid Cymru called, colleagues, obviously, and with others. What Peter said about Mark Drakeford positioning the Welsh Labour Party very different, differently is true. He's positioned it very differently, especially in the aftermath of Brexit. Um, and, and, and I wonder if that has stolen Plaid Cymru's thunder a little bit. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know enough about it. And also, I think historically, Plaid Cymru um, emerged have had, were, were historically certainly much stronger in areas where people spoke Welsh. That's not been the case with the SNP. You know, it's never historically been voted in or, or just being strong amongst those who voted Gaelic or those who identified as Scots speakers. So you had less of that cultural nationalism, um, if you like. And also, I think Plaid Cymru only agreed its, its position on independence in in recent years as well. They've got a very effective leader at the moment, Adam Price, um, but the Labour Party, the situation is very different in Wales from the one in in, in Scotland, although I, I, I hasten to add, I, I don't know as much about it. I'll, I'll, I'll just, on a, on a point that, that's quite helpful in terms of Northern Ireland, and Peter highlighted the possibility of a Northern Irish type solution. Interestingly, in the immediate aftermath of the 2016 EU referendum, the Scottish government put together, along with a group of experts, including European court justice, judges and members of other political parties, a compromise solution to the UK, whereby if certain powers were devolved, Scotland could stay in the single market and the customs union, probably similar actually to where um, Northern Ireland is now, but that was rejected by the UK government. So there was an attempt at compromise and like anything, life moves on um, in politics as well. Thank you.